Hello, Blazer fans. Welcome to another Blazer Power Hour. We're going to be working on the new .NET 8 templates again today. Last week, we took a look at what is new in the .NET 8 templates. Um, there's some really nice reorganization happening with the movement of Blazor and .NET 8 to a more unified framework experience in regards to Blazor server, Blazor WebAssembly, kind of marrying those two things together, adding static server side rendering, all of that is just fantastic news for people using Blazor and .NET 8. Um, however, the templates didn't get much of an overhaul in regards to their markup, how they're structured, the HTML, the CSS that's in there. And I personally feel like it's time to make some changes, get these things to where they're more modernized, um, squash some of the accessibility issues in there, maybe just bring things up to a little bit more of a web standard looking template. So I posted an issue on GitHub and uh, we'll take a look at what that entails. Uh, I'm going to try to work towards getting this at least submitted as a PR as soon as possible so it can be considered, considered for .NET 8. Don't know if it'll make it. That's up to Daniel Roth and the team if they like the changes and are able to incorporate them uh, before the, uh, the release cycle is over. <laughs> so... I'm going to paste this in chat real quick in case you want to take a look. Um, the uh, Blazor project templates, um, they've never been great. They get you started, kind of. Get, you know, we got, we got the counter button we can click on. That's, that's okay. But uh, they're overall just kind of there to get you familiar with the framework. Then you kind of throw them away and... They don't really provide a whole lot of value, in my opinion. <clears throat> um, there's some glaring issues in the templates, at least from my perspective. Uh, I pointed a few of those out last week on the show. I'll point them out again. Um, one of them is the, uh, <clears throat> the code in the template and the CSS, the markup and the CSS in those templates. They seem to kind of fight each other a lot. So one very simple example is um, this section here. We've got an article tag with a PX4 uh, class on it. So what that translates to is a padding of, uh, I'm trying to remember, that's about one and a half rems, something like that. This is a bootstrap class, but essentially it means padding on the x-axis uh, so we've got some kind of padding on each side of this article. And then if we go look at the CSS code for content, which I have linked here, we have a padding value of two rems and one and a half rems, and then it's marked important. Whenever I see important, in CSS, start to think there might be a little bit of a code smell here. And the reason for that is important usually is trying to override something that has some pretty good specificity already to it. Uh, in this case, it's Bootstrap. And Bootstrap is using the important um, on this as well. So the only way to get around uh, the bootstrap value is to mark this as important too. So what we've essentially done is marked up the uh, class with a PX of four, a padding of on the X axis of four, um, and then gone into CSS and overridden it with these new values. And Basically, one obsoletes the other. In this case, the CSS wins. That makes the uh, class inside of the HTML useless. So it's redundant code that's doing nothing, and it's just sitting there. Uh, Fuel Snavel, what did you get at the state of HTML survey? Um, I don't remember doing the HTML 
state of HTML survey, but um, is there an HTML state of HTML survey? I've done the CSS one. I didn't see the review this year. Um, I was busy. Didn't, I, I know it's out. We did a show on it here on uh, Code It Live, but I didn't actually get a chance to look at it. Um, I, I definitely do look at those, though, every year. I need to get some time to revisit that. But this is just one small issue here uh, where we've got these um, things overriding back and forth. It's like a tug of war between CSS code and the um, HTML code. And usually the reason for something like this is there is a a uh, couple developers working on the project together and they both have kind of a different perspective or opinion on when to use CSS, when to use uh, Bootstrap, or maybe they're just unaware of how Bootstrap works and they're more used to using CSS, whatever the case may be, it's happening in here quite often. Um, so things just are a little bit clunky when you try to go in and make modifications to the template. So that's just one instance of it. There's some accessibility issues as well. Uh, one really simple thing that people get wrong quite often is taking this focus um, uh, feature of the browser and kind of nullifying it by putting outline none on top of it. So you see H1 focus outline none. Um, this is just one of the most common accessibility mistakes that people make in general. Um, for some reason, there'll be a stakeholder that doesn't like the aesthetics of uh, something being outlined. Um, unfortunately, this changes the way um, screen readers handle the content when you mark outline none on it. This is an accessibility feature you're just essentially turning off because you personally don't feel like you like the way it looks. So we don't do that. That's something that probably needs to be uh, taken out of uh, the template altogether. Um, another thing is the semantic meaning of elements that are in um, the layout. So one of the things I need to look at is article and main. Um, these ones kind of tricky, but there are some that are obviously semantically incorrect. Uh, if we look inside of the current template, we have this big section here and it is a nav. The nav is okay. The nav just means uh, this semantically contains some sort of navigation and screen readers use this as a key uh, to tell the user that this is a navigation section. Um, that is all fine and good. However, um, let's see, there's a, I don't see it here. There was an unordered list in here somewhere uh, in the template that I have. And that unordered list, I don't see the UL tag here. Um, in the version I have, there's an unordered list here, and the unordered list does not have list items. Um, it just has these divs. So, uh, you know, you have the nav, um, you have a UL, and then there's just divs jammed inside of it. And that is not appropriate semantics either. So this one, should essentially have a UL with LIs, uh, list items underneath of it. Um, I'll have to double check and see. It's not in this template how I ended up with the unordered list items that don't have the list item tag here. So I wonder if there's a history on this file maybe we could look at um, that shows. I don't see it in there maybe somewhere in its history no that's on the code side i don't see it so not in the history there i don't know how i ended up with a nav ul on mine but it was there um and then we're, we're making use of bootstrap and it's a new version it has the ability to use 
uh, CSS uh, variables. We're not taking advantage of that, and that would be a nice have kind of upgrade. Um, but some of these other things need to be addressed. Another thing that I noticed too is the structure of um, the page is a little weird. I kind of highlighted that here as well. Um, we should probably just pull up the template and take a look at it so where I can kind of show some of these things live here on the show. So that we have that, this top bar thing and, and we have a nice sidebar with a collapsible menu and whatnot. And I think either, uh, I, I kind of modified this one to see what it does when a lot of things are added. Let's do a brand new one. Let's do file new, uh, stop this from running. File new project, we'll do a little code review, we'll nitpick at some things, and then we'll look at a corrected version of it. So just to make things simple, I'm not gonna include any of the WebAssembly or server interactive components here. I'm just gonna go ahead and get kind of the bare bones template, but not the completely blank template because that doesn't have these problems. Uh, we pop over to Solution Explorer here, drop open components, and let's go straight into main layout.razor. And we'll give this a run. So one of the things uh, that kind of stands out here is uh, the semantic meanings again of some of the stuff that's here. So we have divs have no, no meaning whatsoever. Um, this might stand to be a, uh, an, an article tag. I'm not sure. I still have to do a little bit of, more of a review on it. And this should be possibly, um, this contains the sidebar. And again, it's kind of odd, like the page itself in the markup, the sidebar comes first. Then we have this main section. Um, then we have inside of the main section is another navigation essentially. And this one's across the top of the page. And you can see this when we render it out and it's just, it kind of feels strange to me the way the markup is versus where the elements end up in the final page. So we can kind of put these side by side a little bit here and, and do a deeper dive. So this, uh, sidebar comes first and that sidebar is here. The main wraps, um, this section here. And then we've got, I guess the sidebar extends up a little bit further into the space as well. Um, then we have essentially another navigation here. Um, and when you use a main tag, you're not really supposed to have navigation inside of it. Um, at least not like another nav bar type of navigation or any other type of content that's going to be, um, not part of the, the main, um, content of the app. Um, if it stays the same through these page transitions, uh, it should not be up there inside of main. So the, the, um, the static parts of the website like this should not be in here. All right. So that that's kind of an issue. It's not a major one. It's just kind of a nitpick, but it's just kind of odd the way the, the page is structured in my opinion. Now we go to mobile. Um, you can see the, the nav bar gets pulled up. Um, another pet peeve of mine here is we've hidden content that is no longer available. This entire section disappears on mobile and is never seen again. So your mobile users have no way to hit that about link. Um, if you put anything that's even somewhat important in there, they can't access it. So that's an issue. Um, overall, I mean, it's functional. It looks okay. Um, but it just feels a little odd with the markup. Um, in my opinion, there should be um, a, uh, let's bring this down a little bit more. We should have broken this page up into sections where this is a header. 
Um, this is then a, a sidebar and the main content. So we're kind of missing out on an opportunity here where this should be one cohesive piece. This should be the header of the application. It has a more firm semantic meaning too. Uh, this will be the nav bar and this will be the content. Um, for some reason it was chosen to split it sideways uh, with this included in the sidebar. Uh, so we get these three sections like this instead. Um, it makes it a little bit more difficult to, um, to work with when this piece is part of the sidebar and not part of the header. Uh, the web, when we use things on, on the web, uh, the natural flow is usually from right to left left, right, sorry, map, uh, wrapping in that direction. Um, it just has an odd feeling when the page is broken up into columns like this from the get go. Um, so what can we do about that? We'll, we'll take a look in a minute. Let's see if there's anything else that we can, uh, figure out. There's also a lot of stuff going on with this top row class. It's kind of all just very unnecessary. Um, and again, that has a lot more to do with the fact that the page is broken up the way it is. Like this whole top row CSS is just trying to appease the fact that this, this top um, section here that could have been one header is broken up into these two columns. Um, it's, it's just weird. It's very strange. Um, and I looked back and forth between like bootstrap documentation and stuff like that, because it does rely heavily on bootstrap. And, um, this would be a bootstrap nav bar, um, component that is on the side here. So if we look at the documentation for the bootstrap nav bar, um, the way this one is set up is quite different from all the examples I've seen. Uh, and again, I think it has to do with the fact that it's trying to make this two column layout happen and not interfere with this top row. Uh, there's also the nav menu itself and boy, that is weird. I don't know how I ended up with the list items missing from mine. Uh, oh, sorry. This is the wrong project. This is the corrected one. That's how, uh, there's a very slim, like one pixel outline that I'm actually hitting on the outside of the screen here and switching to the completed project. So let's try that again. Nav menu. Yeah. I thought there was an, uh, UL issue in here. Um, I'm not seeing it now. I was getting it yesterday. Let's look at it in the browser and see if we get any warnings from the tooling here. Um, let's see here. We've got a couple things that the browser itself will tell us. Uh, let's see viewport meta content attribute value should not contain maximum scale. Uh, viewport meta element content attribute should not contain user scalable. Uh, migrate entirely to HTTPS to have cookie sent to same site resources. I think that might be a browser link thing. Something strange there. That's not part of the template. Um, form field element should have an ID name or attribute. Uh, that is probably something to do with the collapsible content, um, in the nav bar. So we'll look at that as well. Um, these, I, I don't know where I found this earlier. I had this come up in my template, um, and I thought it was coming from the .NET template. I don't see the UL with the broken LI missing elements. So this seems to be okay. You can do this without list items. Um, it's probably preferable to have them. Uh, so we'll, we'll rewrite this with list items as well. Uh, there's also a lot of padding on all of these that gets kind of fudged in either direction. 
I didn't mean to stop that from running. I want to take a look at this still. It's quite a bit of padding here that um, honestly, I don't think needs to be there. It should come naturally with some of the elements that are here. Um, for example, we have these kind of um, button-like elements that are created in code in the CSS of this file when in actuality they're provided by bootstrap already so i don't understand the additional code that we're writing uh to make those happen and then uh the padding here um this is i think it's being canceled out of the original nav bar and then added back on a per element basis which is also just kind of a, wa a wasteful bit of code. Um, there could be an overall padding on the column, the navbar column, and then not on each individual item that gets rendered in there. Uh, I'm not quite sure why that is the way it is. Uh, so you find a lot of additional markup uh, padding in CSS and stuff like that. It's just kind of uh, code that we don't need. And then it, creates every time we create a list item um, we end up having to append that as tech consulting welcome um, so I'm kind of nitpicking a little bit today if you're just joining me uh, the uh, .NET 8 uh, templates uh, they're experiencing some of the same issues that we had in .NET 7 and earlier. Uh, the template for Blazor really hasn't been updated all that much as far as the HTML and CSS code. Um, there's lots of new features that were added for the framework, but uh, the CSS code itself and the HTML itself not really changing a whole lot over the years. So time, time to kind of get this in line. Um, another one that I find very strange in here, very strange thing happening, is uh, we look at the, the top bar and the nav bar um, parts of the app and look at the CSS code or the uh, bootstrap code being used. Uh, first of all, that top row thing being applied there yet again. Uh, then we have navbar, and then we have navbar dark. And if you look, it's not a dark theme. So for some reason, we have navbar dark, and then we end up overriding like a bunch of the dark behaviors with the lighter colors, uh, and then even customizing the color completely in the background with this um, this gradient, which is not a problem with the gradient. The gradient's okay. Um, not a hater or a fan by any means it's just there it makes it unique you could tell it's a blazer app uh so so there's that like we have uh things that are called dark that are not truly dark and yeah that's an odd one too uh let's see what else we've got in here so the sidebar and the nav bar are kind of the main ones the pages not really an issue. Uh, CSS code, let's take a look in here, see what we've got. Um, we've got a font set uh, to very specific Helvetica. There is a font family by default in Bootstrap. Somebody likes Helvetica, that's fine. Um, this is a no-no, that needs to go immediately. Like we need to get that out of there. Um, we'll mark it out and show what the effects are of that. Uh, we have bootstrap, so I'm not sure why we're doing additional button colors and things. Uh, if we want to just make this unique, that's fine. Um, but there's better ways to change the button color rather than override uh, the default um, bootstrap button primary uh, class. Uh, let's see, we've got some shadows that just seem kind of unnecessary. Um, this is the, the padding on top. There's so many padding issues in this code. Just, it, it seems like uh, mystery meat, like, uh, HTML. We've got, um, We've got all these paddings being set. And 
then they're being reset somewhere else. And odd size is to 1.1 rem. Is that 0.1 rem noticeable by most people? Probably not. Um, and then, like I said, it's built into, a lot of the white spacing is built into Bootstrap already. Why are we fudging it by 0.1 rem? Uh, Smab, I think the page is mobile first and then most of the CSS is to change and work on, that's not the case. Um, so it's, uh, again, a mystery meet of uh, mobile first and desktop first and uh, a little bit of we want to use Bootstrap and a little bit of we want custom CSS and um, not really picking a proper direction on either one. Um, the nav bar possibly, but there's still, again, better ways to do that. Um, it it kind of interferes with, uh, we're like mixing dark theme with light theme in different places. It just, it gets hard to manage. Um, there's better ways to do it. So for this, I think, um, I would keep the air boundaries and ditch most of what's in here. Uh, if we look at the CSS for main layout, um, again, here's another one. <clears throat> Page. Completely an unnecessary thing. Why do we need a page selector that has position relative, display flex, flex direction column, other than to appease that weird decision to make the sidebar cemented on the side the way it is and then main flex one um that's probably to keep the the page full screen all of the time um there's things in bootstrap to take care of that uh there's our gradient uh let's see here the top row, this whole top row thing could probably just go away. Uh, here's where we're not uh, mobile first. Um, this min, there's a min width and a max width. So there's things being done um, with uh, the top bar at certain screen sizes. And Currently in the template, there is no authorization. There's something with authorization buttons being added up there. Uh, so this one's hard to test unless we go back to .NET 7 and take a look, which we'll, we'll probably do here in a few minutes. Um, what else do we have? This is a min width. This is more of the mobile first type of uh, flow here. We change the page flow. We do a lot with the sidebar and the top bar again this top bar i'm telling you this top row thing is just an annoyance at this point um and then we've got the blazer error ui stuff is in here again is that these were error boundary these are error ui okay two different things all right let's take a look at nav menu razor a lot of code in here the toggler, I'll get into in a minute. Uh, so auth supposed to come back in RC2. That's good to hear. <sighs> we'll talk about this navbar toggler. This is creative. Um, I like creative, and then I don't like creative. And I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, let's, let's dive into this thing. So I found this one very cool, but uh, the, the top bar toggles by clicking on this button. You look at all the bootstrap examples, the nav bar toggle is a button and that button is built into the nav bar. If we get this zoomed in here, um, any bootstrap sample, right click inspect on this button and you are going to get a button. If you do it in Blazor, you get a checkbox. You might be thinking why on earth 
would this toggle button be a checkbox? And uh, it took me a second. Why would, why would you choose a checkbox over a button? The reason they did this, and we can look at the code here, and we can see there is a navbar toggler checked CSS attribute. Um, you can call click on a button, Smab. Uh, you, but what's interesting here is you can toggle a checkbox. When you toggle the checkbox, there is a sibling selector that turns on and off the navigation. So when we're on a smaller screen and we click on this checkbox, it's essentially checked at this point. Uh, matter of fact, we can probably go in here and remove some of the styling of it. And let's see if we can take that, the appearance, there we go. Checked, unchecked, there we are. So when it's checked, there's another selector on the sibling, which happens to be the menu that hides and shows that panel. Clever. It's a clever use of a checkbox. I like the cleverness of it. What I'm worried about is, is this accessible? That's something I'm not quite sure of. Um, I've... The reason I'm not sure is because this isn't like a normal behavior that we do. Like we don't normally tie um, checkbox toggles to an entire menu. Uh, I have to research that one and see. Like is that an accessible thing to do that? Can I turn off an entire rendered portion of navigation? Is it still accessible? Am I getting the right context? in the screen reader for that checkbox? Um, is it just coming up as an, an input checkbox with no kind of um, audio cues as to what it's doing? And I doubt that it does. I'm gonna say I doubt that it does because if we look at the code for it, we have input type checkbox, we have a title, it says navigation menu and just a class. I don't think there's enough there to let the screen reader know we're taking this entire section of code that follows and just disappearing it from the UI. Um, the reason though that this was chosen above a button is because a button click would require the uh, page to be interactive. You would have to have either some uh, uh, C sharp code for Blazor to toggle um, the CSS class on the the nav bar, um, or some JavaScript to do the same. With the input box, we can do the static server rendering. Not have to worry about if it's Blazor friendly yet, uh, whether it's got Blazor WebAssembly or even writing some JavaScript code here, uh, none of it is necessary. So I get the why, I like the how, but I don't know if the accessibility requirements are met. Uh, one of the main things that it's missing here is ARIA controls. ARIA controls should be here and it should have an ID and that ID should match the value of ARIA controls. Uh, the ID would go here and it would look like this. Uh, so to the screen reader, and I don't know if this even works on an input, I know it works on buttons and other elements that have click events, but ARIA controls would then signify that this piece of UI controls this entire block down here that's disappearing when I when I toggle. Um, there is a little bit of JavaScript code right here. 
And what that JavaScript code does, essentially, if you click on anything inside of this div, it then handles a click event on the input here, which checks or unchecks the, the but or the uh, checkbox. And that is to dismiss the, um, the menu if you click an item from it. So the menu doesn't stay open as you navigate. So there, there's a tiny snip of, of JavaScript here. Um, that same bit could probably end up being within a button and may lead to some better um, accessibility, but I'm not certain, like, I didn't want to dig in too deep on that yet because I get the why. I really get the why. Like, we want to be independent of the interactivity part um, of Blazor and .NET 8. So this, I understand, is just missing some um, ARIA features that would probably make it better. Um, one thing that's missing from here, and you cannot get through the checkbox, is the ARIA um, expanded. And this should be true, false, whatever the state of the navigation is. So we should have ARIA controls, we should have ARIA expanded, and this should be true or false, depending on whether it's visible or not. Um, and we cannot do this piece with an input checkbox alone. It needs to have um, some kind of JavaScript, whether it's another, you know, on-click inline like that one, or there's something else added for interactivity there. Changed nav bar toggler to hash nav bar, yeah, nav bar toggler. So you gave it an ID, but it only acts on that one element. There's a couple um, things in here. There's the nav bar toggler checked. That's the most important one. You'd have to change that to an ID. Um, you don't have to utilize the ID just because you added it to this. Um, you don't have to utilize it in CSS just because you added aria controls and an id of whatever these just have to match they could be anything they could literally be anything so i'd probably just leave the css as is and um, add in the aria bit there this is the problem um can't can't get the expanded to toggle true and false through this uh, this checkbox here. So you'd have to maybe put an on click on this, do the same type of thing that this has, and say like on click document query selector all, and then um, find the uh, the nav sidebar by id or whatever it is uh and then grab the attribute and flip it but it's it starts getting into so much code like i don't know if that's something that people want to see in line or not you have a problem with the nav bar element being a class hmm. a toggler yeah it's that one's a tough one to fix that's probably the hardest thing to fix of all this is that that nav bar toggle um, thing there. So there, there's the nav bar toggle. It requires a little bit of CSS code as well to make it work. Um, here's another one that is odd uh, to get the scrolling to work. I found a lot of just overriding um, this like whole section here. Just a lot of, a lot of stuff gets overridden back and forth. <laughs> yeah, I like their their creativity too. So this is my take on what the template so far, what I think the template should look like. And uh, happy to hear feedback on it. Um, it's also available in the link up at the top of the GitHub issue on this. Uh, let me post the GitHub issue again. 
And uh, where's the uh, GitHub issue? Let's see if I can grab it out of the chat history here. Uh, it's not going to let me do that. Is it uh, ASP net? Something like that. Oh, where are you at? I'll just go to my homepage and find it again. Really, I'm signed out now? How did I manage to sign out? Is it the, It's an incognito window, isn't it? Let's not do that. Like GitHub. There we go. Uh, issues and... Yeah, let me let me know what you think of this. All right. So as you can see, I've taken a stab at fixing the template. Um, we'll run side by side here too, and show the before and after. This is the existing one. And this is the new one. Um, you can ignore the buttons for now. I'm trying to work on something and we'll, we'll demo what that is. So these are the two templates. I try to keep it visually the same as I possibly could. Um, I wanted to keep the look and feel identical. Um, I didn't want this to be my opinion of what the theme should look like. Uh, I wanted it to be more about usability than anything. Yeah, that's another one of the suggestions I have. Now, backwards compatibility is going to be an issue. I know um, when you do file new project, I believe it lets you select between .NET 6, 7, and 8. Um, I'll have to see. I have to go back and look and make sure that's the case. But if we add section outlet, which I'd like to do, then um, the... Uh, template would not be compatible with .NET 7. So they'd have, you'd have to have like some kind of if statement in the template generation tooling that takes that out. Um, there's some minor differences in here that like the tag or the, the uh, link over there, just some minor stuff that it, it honestly could get, go either way, in my opinion. Um, I try to keep the look and feel the same. Uh, the menu, um, one thing I did different, watch the about at the top, especially if you got your log in and out up there, which I believe that's where they go. Um, the log in and out disappear. Uh, this one, it does not, it wraps. And that's because I'm treating the top as an entire element that goes across rather than two headers of these columns, which I, again, I just feel like we're swimming upstream the way their page is laid out. It's, um, these like kind of like it's a column here, an element here and a column here, which it's kind of just odd alignment. So what I've done is this is an element. And then there's the nav bar, and then there's the main here. So you'll notice that when this goes mobile, we do not lose this link anymore. And if we added more links, uh, we could probably do this just quickly in the browser here by doing inspect on this. Um, and then if I... Can I do that. I don't want to paste it inside the anchor. If we add more links, they, they would kind of trail down the page here. Um, that's not great. It's not terrible. Uh, you could also just go in and set the, um, uh, you would set this item to uh, flex. See if I can get a selector on it. 
There we go. We could just do that on mobile. And um, we would have our login and log out buttons possibly there, right? And then when we expand this, it's still accessible. So we're not losing that. And so that's how those items should flow. And it looks like keeping that to flex doesn't hurt anything either. So that pro probably should just be a flex. Um, so that's one change you can see. What else do we have? Other than that, visually, it's pretty much the same. Uh, I need to maybe tweak the rounded corners on this. Didn't come through for some reason. Notice the padding is about the same. I didn't really change any of the padding, uh, but I removed a ton of the padding code. There's just so much padding like declaration in the, the HTML and in the CSS that just was so unnecessary. It's like we're padding and padding and padding and it's just going in all the wrong places. Uh, there may be a little additional padding in, in my version of it, which is probably okay, especially if you're on mobile and you're trying to tap on these things. Um, the notice the uh, the buttons are the same. We've got the same button effect, okay? Same exact button effect on on these guys. Um, I removed all the button effect code from the template. It's already in Bootstrap. I don't know why it was additionally added uh, to the template. So I just I wiped out a ton of code in this thing. So if we look at the code, let's kind of compare a little bit. Uh, let's move this project over and take this one, kind of put them side by side. Uh, one of the biggest changes here that I think the teams, you know, the .NET team might want to look at and just kind of um, weigh in on. Uh, in my opinion, there should be a header component. So you'll see there's no header component on this side. There is a header component on mine. I broke that whole top bar into a header component. Um, it just needed to be a header component. It just needed to be there. And if we look at the structure of main layout versus this one, um, they're very similar, except now we have a header component we don't have a page anymore. I don't know why that page class was there to begin with. Um, we can use container fluid. We're already using Bootstrap. Why write a page selector in pretty much the same code that's here when we already have it? Didn't didn't make a lot of sense. Um, the uh, it has a row. Uh, we have this top row. You know that. I don't know. Just kind of simplified this out a little bit. We, we took the top row out and moved it to the head of the page. Um, yeah, a footer component would be nice, map, but I'm trying to you know keep keep it about as the same as I can. But uh, the this whole top row section got removed and moved here. Where, where I feel like it belongs. The, let's see, the nav menu is the same. Uh, and the article part is the same. So essentially this is about the same thing, but I moved all of this up into header. Um, but the header, if we look at it, uh, the header is a nav bar and uh, it spans the entire width of the page. Um, it also contains that thing that says company name in it or whatever the app name is. And there's our links that go in that section. This is where I'd put a section outlet as well. So inside of this somewhere, I would replace this with a section outlet. Um, actually be the, the nav bar portion of the nav portion of it. I'd probably have a section in here now that we have sections. So that's what header is. So header, the header component is the entire row at the top of the page. This is your header component. 
So that's header. Um, and notice the semantic meaning as well. This is a header class. Uh, actually, now that I say that, this should be an H1. Right here, not just an anchor tag, it should be an H1 tag. So I'll have to look at adding that as well. Because it's inside of a header, it should actually have a header in it. There's going to be some styling issues with that, so I'm not going to do it right this second. We'll have to work on that one. Alrighty. So I'm just going to comment it out right now, but that needs to be a header. That's another semantic thing. All right. So we have our header. Let's look at the, the um, nav bar. Nav bar took some slight changes too. So if we look at nav menu, uh, this used to have the, what is now the header in it. This was part of the header. Moved that out into header which leaves us with the input checkbox and uh, the divs here. Um, again, I've changed this one into uh, UL. And I also added nav pills to it. What nav pills does, it gives us that button effect on the following nav link items without uh, having to hard code those in, uh, they're part of Bootstrap. We're already using Bootstrap. I also added a gap. I added a gap, nav pills, and let's see, it was already flex column. So by adding three CSS selectors here, or uh, classes here, I eliminated a ton of CSS code that was custom. And if we look at navmenu.razor, uh, we've got our sidebar, which um, I'm trying to remember where this is in the original code. We've got 103 lines versus 85, 102 versus 85. So I eliminated you know, about 20 lines of code there. Is there any comment dialogue solution for Blazor WebAssembly? What is a comment dialogue? Like a pop-up dialogue? I'm not sure what a comment dialogue is. So uh, eliminated 20 lines of code here. A lot of that was just padding and stuff. Um, let's see what else we've got here. Oh, like discuss? I don't know. There's probably some JavaScript interop stuff out there for like a, a discuss or something like that. Um, a lot of those things were written for, for JavaScript. I don't know if you want to reinvent the wheel and get one that's... Usually they're backed by like a service already, so you don't have to worry about storage and authentication and all that stuff. So, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not aware of any NuGet packages off the top of my head. Um, it's a good question, though. I have to look that up sometime. I shortened some of the CSS selectors here too. They were just a little verbose. They don't need to be with CSS isolation. So things are just a little, overall a little bit cleaner in here. Um, it feels so weird. I feel like there was an update somehow since the last time I looked at the template. Um, these are now in REMS and I don't believe this was in REMS before. I have to look through my commit history. This was in pixels, so I continued with pixels. Um, but a lot of the code is, is cleaned up. There's quite a few things that are gone in here. That'd be a great idea. 
Uh, I'll have to put that in my notes. Thanks for the suggestion. Uh, definitely something we could look at, like how to how to implement uh, a commenting system. That would be a good one. That'd be a great show. Appreciate that. VV go go online. Is that how it's pronounced? All right. So let's see. What else do we have between these two? We could look there. There is some stuff in header now. There isn't a header, uh, but if you look, there's a main layout.razor.css, and there's not a main layout razor CSS in here. So moving stuff to header was enough to eliminate all of the code from main layout.razor. So deleted all of that. My header.razor has 20 lines of code. Um, these I missed. This probably needs to come back and be put back into main layout.razor. Um, I don't know how I overlooked those. So 80 lines of code, you could say, were removed. 80 lines of code, and I guess 60 if you cut the difference. Uh, 80 line, or 60 lines of code gone. This needs to come back. That I need to add. I don't know how I missed that one. That needs to go. We need to do that right now. Create a CSS file, and we'll drop that in. So there's about 100 lines of code gone total between uh, nav menu and main layout. 100 lines of code gone. They were removed in RC1. They were moved there in RC1. I feel like I started on, I have RC1 installed. It's, it's a fresh install of RC1 as well. But I feel like some reason I'm I'm back a, a version. They're all up to date, which I don't know how I ended up with an older copy, but some things seem like they've changed since I've looked at this and it, it just, I just installed it like three days ago. I started this on Friday. Somehow there's been a change. Um, oh, they were removed. Is this not an RC1 template I just did? Let's double check. Let's try this on. Let's go to. Mm. Let's go ahead and close these out. All right, so I've got, we're on RC1, right? RC2 is not out yet. RC1. Do .NET new. Um, we've got Blazor server app. I'm not sure where that template is in the command line, but I just did file new project from Visual Studio, and this is what I got. So apparently they are in main layout.razor. We can also look at the uh, the GitHub repo and see where they're at there. Yeah, they were originally in site CSS, and that's another thing that I I took a lot of code out of. So I'm just going to jump over to the issue again real fast and then where I marked any of these, we can see where this lives. So this lives under, this is quite the tree here, uh, the main ASP.NET Core source project templates, web project templates, content, web C-sharp, 
Web C Sharp again, components, layout, main razor, CSS. Uh, so the main layout, I took all of this, this Blazor UI code, I forgot to leave in there, but I essentially deleted all of this code. I mean, it's, it's gone. It's completely unnecessary to make the layout happen. So um, that's all gone. Uh, there's just a few things, lines of code in the header. Just a few lines of code in the header. Uh, the nav menu took 20 lines of code out. And where did that 20 lines of code go, right? You might be wondering, like, how did they get to be exactly the same look and feel? Uh, because they were already in Bootstrap. Yeah, removing Bootstrap is... No, they're not using SAS. Um, they, uh, the .NET team didn't want to add SAS. I can understand why. It's another build tool that needs to be added. Um, it's another point of failure. Um, and this is just like a getting started template. It's not meant to be opinionated. Uh, the only opinion that was made here is to use Bootstrap. Um, they could have probably hand-coded something in CSS that's very basic, but they decided to add Bootstrap and just go with that, and that's okay. Bootstrap's not too bad. Not my favorite thing, but you can opt out of all of it. Um, and I agree with Smab. Uh, Bootstrap would have been great five years ago when this came out. Uh, not necessary anymore, which is probably something I want to talk about next. So I started looking at the uh, latest version of Bootstrap. Um, again, it's making it's pretty heavily used in here uh, and eliminated a lot of custom CSS code that was in here, just overlapping it anyway. Uh, App.css. We need to look at that real quick too, though. App.css, I think... There's a couple lines of code removed in here. Um, HTML and body is set by Bootstrap. We don't need to set this again. Um, it just needs to be told which font to use. Uh, the these are up for the chopping block next. Button primary, in my opinion, needs to go. Um, I kept it around because I want to see the colors that are, that are being used. I think the colors help show that this is a Blazor app, gives it a little bit of branding and character, but we don't need to make our own button primary override here. Uh, I'm not sure why we're adding shadows to the text boxes either. Um, somebody liked shadows when this got created. That's all I can think of. Um, we could keep that around, give or take, I don't know. And then, like, some of the other stuff, validation message, uh, I think it's part of the built-in validators that are part of the framework. So valid and invalid, they have hard-coded red colors, a lot of hard-coded colors all over the place. Uh, one of the things that I was working on next, hence the buttons on this page, when you look at it, is um, we've I've got all the buttons here, and if you look at Bootstrap, if you just do a quick uh, dive into uh, there's I, I gotta look at these meta tags up. It keeps nagging at too. If you look at the root of the document, there's variables. And the variables should change the color of some of the UI elements. And it doesn't quite do it, and I'm trying to understand why. Um, I know Bootstrap has these things. So, like, for example, BS Danger. We've got declared red throughout the entire um, CSS. We could just be using the variables that are here. <laughs> Welcome, Thindle. 
Uh, so we've got a lot of colors already defined here. Um, if we look at the button code, you can see even more variables in here. There's BS button color. Um, so this is button primary. And then I don't know why Bootstrap doesn't pull from the primary color source, but for some reason they have yet again defined colors um, inside of the button itself. So they've locally defined variables for all of these things. So this makes it a little bit more difficult to theme. But if you're using the bootstrap variables, this is something that's really cool that you can do. Uh, so in real time here, we'll take the app. And if you look, there's a body tag called BS data BS theme light. If I change this to dark, we get a dark theme for free. Because I'm using Bootstrap 5.3 and there is a feature built in with CSS variables to swap out the main theme variables with a dark theme, I can just do that. Um, we need to tap into some of the variables to change that header for up top, for example. But if we incorporated these variables into the template, it would make it a lot more user-friendly. So there, there's quite a bit of stuff that we could do with this. Um, the button, for example, uh, let's look there. They show you how to do this really easy in the bootstrap. Um, bootstraps five CSS variables, documentation. Here's all of the root variables. Um, insight to how we're using variables. I think this is, let's see. They show you how to make a custom button in this somewhere. Uh, where is it at? Oh, that's not the bootstrap docs anymore. Let's do button. Maybe it's in the button. Variables. There we go. There's all the variables, the SAS mix-ins, but they did have a custom button code in here. Let's see if I can find it again. Now that brought me back there. I saw it yesterday. They had a clearly defined example of how to do a custom button without SAS. Hey, welcome to the show. Glad to see you again. Thanks for stopping in. Uh, so they have the, the button primary here. I'll have to look up how to um, not override like all of the primary stuff, but uh, create our own button style. But for example, the button primary, if we wanted to uh, override the colors in Bootstrap without reusing or creating these hard-coded colors, uh, we would just use their variable setup. And let's find the documentation again. CSS variables. Um, Got to go back to buttons and then go back to variables here. 
So these are all the variables that are available. The ones that we want to focus on are, I hope that's, that's all the SAS variables. I want the CSS ones. They're probably named the same, to be honest. They need to update their docs a little bit. Let's just inspect. That's one easy way to find them. So button primary. Here's all the real-time button variables here. We'll just take all of them for now. And we'll paste them right here. So what we had before was the color. Uh, that is the same. So we don't need that code. Background color. The background color is something that is being changed. So button color background. Uh, if we want the, the blazer flavored version of this, we could paste that color in there and save it. And then I hopefully would see that change. I don't see it. Let's try redoing cache. Did we get the right color on the button primary? So button primary, the color should be overridden. So they really didn't choose the blazer primary color. Why are we doing this? This is what I don't get. So let's look at the colors here. The original bootstrap color is, uh, let's see, let's go back. Let's undo that. The original bootstrap color is this. Let's just throw this in the browser for the love of God. That's the original bootstrap button color. For some reason we have code in our template that sets it to this color because the bootstrap or the uh, default theme of Blazor needed a color. How many people are gonna be able to tell that these are two different colors? Did we need extra code in the template to get a slightly different shade of blue? Um, let's see, we've got some discussions going on here. Their docs are updated. Make sure you're looking at the latest version. Okay, so maybe I'm on, on the wrong version of the bootstrap docs. Bootstrap 5.3, I think, is the latest. Yeah, okay, 5.3. Maybe I was on the wrong ones. Um, they show you how to make custom buttons and whatnot in one of these. I saw it the other day. Color modes, colors. I find it odd that they don't use the uh, colors and the buttons directly. Used for hyperlinks, focus styles, component and in interactive form states, but not the buttons. There we go. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, that Who said that? Is that Scott that said that? Look at the right docs. <laughs> That's a good point. Uh, so yeah, there's how you create a custom button.
So they're saying you put your own. Oh, this is in SAS still. That's still a SAS example. So it's easy to create a button variant in SAS, but still, if you want to just tweak one of the buttons, you don't have to write a bunch of code. So they're, they're moderately changing the color of one of the buttons in, um, in the template. And if we wanted to still do this, I mean, I would probably just advise against this. It's just not different enough. I don't know if this justifies changing the code, like, or adding code to the template to get these two theme colors in there. We're slightly different shades of blue. If we want to do that, though, uh, we could incorporate that in the code through a, um, God, it was hard to see even, but if we just set background color and border color, so they added a different border color. If we did that, uh, left the rest of this the same. So essentially all we need is the things we're changing. We're not changing the hover color. We just changed the border color and the background color. And the foreground color was even the same. So we don't need that. If we wanted to change the button primary, we could do it like that. And that's the darker shade of blue. That's, that's it. So that, that would be the replacement for that. Um, changing the button link color. Um, is button link a thing in Bootstrap? Is that one of their... Is that a thing in here? Button, button link. Actually, we could tell if we find one of these. Um, I don't know if I'm using button link anywhere, but it changes all of the hrefs too. So what we could do, I got to clean up some of this. I keep clicking everywhere. Let's get that off the screen. Um, if we wanted to do that, we probably should just go in to the, um, the uh, variables. I copied all the bootstrap variables over to a file. And uh, if we change the blue to that color and change primary to that color, that should change all of the blues that are in the blazer template. Um, and then we need to actually have an href ta tag on the page. Do we have one in here? We don't have an href tag to even see this. Uh, main layout, no. Uh, let's go into the home page and just add a couple, like a link or something. So we can see what that would be. <laughs> Petition to bring the old blue button back. It's not broke. Why fix it? Right? Like we're changing these colors and they're, they're not really that different. Like why, why keep that kind of code in a template like that? So it's just weird opinion things. Like you can see it's barely changing the color. It's just slightly darker. That's I'm, I'm literally changing it back from the default to what it was. You're not going to notice that. The border things. What what am I missing? What did I miss?
Yeah, the the uh, the code is updated to the latest version. The bootstrap code I'm using is on the latest version. I didn't have the docs on the right version. Uh, so, okay, those were possibly the original bootstrap colors. Yeah, I don't think like this, in my opinion, can go. Um, these could probably go. And then we have things like valid and invalid. So if we look at Bootstrap again, we look at colors. Uh, let's see. Let's look at variables one more time. So we have uh bootstrap success this chunk here primary secondary info and success these are ones that we should be using like everywhere i'm just going to paste them here just for a reference real quick so instead of doing something like this, which I think this is going to end up being green, right? Let's copy this, paste it in the browser. Like if this is just green, okay, we've got green. Instead of hard coding green there, let's just use the bootstrap success color. Uh, copy and paste right there. And we could do the same for red, right? We have danger. We drop that there. And now that we have danger, we can put it here. Um, they, they keep saying they would like to take this off bootstrap, but in reality, like we need something that's simple that gets developers going with the template out of the box. If it was 100% custom CSS code, I don't think people would like that. As much as I don't mind continuing on with some good CSS code, I mean, I could probably rewrite this whole template with a few lines of CSS code. Um, but the problem with that is once you need to build something outside of the template you're done like you have to start writing css uh with bootstrap there if people don't know css that well there's still a lot of people out there that are trying bootstrap that are coming from other uh walks of dotnet life like uh web forms or sorry wind forms xamarin uh, soon to be maui other stuff um they are coming into this and um using using boots or using blazer and they you know they can pick up on bootstrap pretty quick um put some buttons down make them look nice and things whereas if it's all custom css code they got something else they have to learn uh let's see we have some shades of white in there as well so you'd, you'd essentially take those and run with those too. Let's see, we've got link color, background, BS white. I don't know if I want white, depends. These are some things that I would need to check on is like the error boundaries actually render one and see what it comes up as um i don't want black but they have a white and the reason you want to use these variables is so you can toggle the uh, theme really easy i think that should be the variable without the rgb suffix 
Uh, we're just getting the RGB version of it. Is did they not use them? BS primary. So for these colors, they don't use RGB. For these, they do. Which ones are they using in the final result? Maybe right there. I grabbed these. I didn't realize there was two different ones. The RGBs are nice if you need to um, change the color palette. Maybe that's what they're there for, so you can dynamically take them and run them through. Yeah. You can run them through the RGB function. Okay. Good catch there. So we'd want to replace those. And this is all that's in the app CSS now, if we do that. Um, I did, however, add a file with all the bootstrap uh, variables in it. But essentially, you could comment out the ones that you're not changing. So I think we changed blue. We did change blue there, but really don't need to. You change those back. Um, I changed the Helvetica font face in there. So what I should be doing is commenting all of this out. And then taking this one out of the comments. That that one actually changed. This is kind of my reference here. And I have it I have it attached to the app.razor file. You'll see I've got bootstrap, then bootstrap variables. So I can just have one place to go change variables if I need to. Uh, so this is my file to do that. And that that way I can change the entire font system and now i know where to go find that setting so uh i i changed the color the blue color back to just default bootstrap blue like there's no reason to really change that no reason to change the blues in this at all so like another thing we could do is like set the gradient to where it can be turned on and off. People don't like it. They can remove it. Um, there's uh, possibly some settings that we could add there. Uh, let's, let's do a really um, good example here. So I said we could take this and change the theme to dark, but then we have an issue with the top bar and the icon not changing correctly. So if I go to this, I have top bar nav light, um, background light. This actually would have to change as well. It's using this background light. It would need to be background dark, wouldn't it? Yeah, so they don't even do that with the css do they with the variables what happens if we don't set a background on that does it automatically have bar dark do we even need the that setting there let's see what happens if this is not set to light or dark background light background dark was that a redundant setting as well no it did give it did give it some color. Um, those are things that need to be taken into account, though. Nav bar light. What happens if we don't have a theme color there? Nothing seems to change. Yeah, there's... There's two different colors going on in there. And I think it might have just been the sample I pulled them from. There we go. So we don't even need those. There's some more code I can go back and delete. Um, that was in header.rate or no header dot 
yeah, header dot razor. I've got the CSS. So don't need background light and don't need nav bar light there because the variables now should take care of those. Um, it does make it a stark white header <clears throat> header up here. But now we've got at least the theme support. And yeah, they realized that updated on page change. Um, that is actually at the app.razor setting level here. So it's like hard coded for now. In, um, in a JavaScript app, you'd have something that can toggle that. I, with the static rendering stuff, there's no way to toggle that body element like that. But it is supported as a hard coding, hard coded item. And it just needs to be on the outermost part of the, the app there. It doesn't necessarily have to be on body. At the very least, it would have to be on the main layout upper div here. So once you have interactivity, oh no, it'd have to be around the whole app. You'd have to add a container div on the outside. Yeah, you can use that, but you have to have two, um, you have to have two CSS files, I believe, to make that toggle automatically. Unless you use something interactive like JavaScript. But um, wh what do you think overall of the changes? Adding a header.razor file, um, changing the layout in main layout to where it is no longer this strange two column-y thing with this header up top, but just a, um, a header a nav and a main section versus this this was before is just odd um that change was made and then eliminating about 100 lines of css code gaining support for css variables and um it's kind of simplifying things. I mean, it's a lot easier to reason about the code that's here. There's been a couple accessibility improvements made. Um, it's overall a lot less code. Yep. That's, that's where I'm at with this right now. I'm going to go in and tweak it a little bit, continue with the uh, variables. Smab's got an example here of overriding the variables with CSS. I'll have to take a look at that. Um, But uh, just making use of more of these uh, variables in here and setting this up, for example, the nav menu, um, this, this sidebar menu that's in nav menu. If we look at the CSS for this, we've got this background. Um, that's the toggler. I don't want the toggler. I want the sidebar, there it is, linear gradient. Um, you could take the gradient out and put it in a variable. Let me see if I can do it this easily. Let's set a variable up here 
in app CSS. We'll put it in root for now. Um, maybe I should just put it in, these are all bootstrap variables, but eh, we'll put it in app CSS for now. So it doesn't belong to bootstrap, but we'll drop a root variable here and we'll call it uh, I think they're using BI's blazer, oh, that was blazer icon, but we'll just say sidebar gradient for now. Sidebar gradient like that. And then we should be able to set the sidebar gradient here. Sidebar gradient, where's that overflow? Oh, deleted the semicolon off the end. Um, they're, they're actually blazer icons now. One of the things they said they were gonna do, and I, I emailed Dan Roth on this, is they, they wanted to take out the icons from Bootstrap because they were heavy. Um, they created their own icons for the demo. So if you look, there's BI, which is, I guess, blazer icon. And if you dig into navmenu.brazer, um, you can see there's the, the icons for the few examples they have. So um, what's interesting is they, they said they removed them, but they're still there. All of the bootstrap icons are still, still in there. So somebody forgot to check a box on a build or something. Yeah, they're, they're poaching them out of the official bootstrap package. So they, they picked their three favorites and then they forgot to eliminate them from the bootstrap CSS. So they're, they're all still there. Um, all right. So I added to app CSS, this sidebar gradient, and then in the nav menu, I've got sidebar gradient. Let's try to run it, see if I still have a sidebar gradient. And I still have a sidebar gradient. If I were to go in though and set the sidebar gradient to something different, um, it is none of value for gradient, I think it is. I could essentially turn it off and then I would have to set some overrides for the, um, the buttons in there. But at least I have control over it. Uh, black sun, uh, you have to do a fully qualified gradient to at least get something in there. So we'd want to fall back in case that is um, overridden. if you set it to none. So we'd want background color here. And th that would go in another variable as well. If I keep them separate values, I should be able to come in and turn off the gradient and still have a um, background color here. So if I do none, now it's black. There we go. That's what I was aiming for. So you could, if somebody didn't like the gradient, they could turn it off and then there'd be another variable to change the solid background. If you want to do a solid background, um, or you could put a gradient in that is a solid gradient. 
Um, the top here is a solid color now. Uh, all that hackery to take this and make it a column, let that flow as one element, but now that it's gone, I made it a solid color. So that's that could be a thing. And you don't have to specify the gradient in the root either, like I just did here. Um, you could take this portion of it and you could put it here like that. And now the root, um, the root variable is optional. So I could actually take this root element out. I don't need that anymore. It's still overridable, but now it's optional to override it. So notice I still have a gradient, but if I were to come into my, um, my app, inspect, um, go up to the head here, say root, and then type it in. Um, sidebar gradient, none. Uh, is that what it's called? Missing an E. There we go. <laughs> Sidbar. <laughs> So it's optional now to even have that there. So I don't need to like pollute the um, index file here, whatever it's called, the uh, app CSS file with a bunch of settings. I can just come in and set these up like that with defaults. Now they can be, they can be tweaked from anywhere. So that'd be my next step is to come through here and add some variables in. And they really don't change anything for somebody that doesn't know how CSS variables work. Um, and then if people do know how CSS variables work, they can retheme their apps very easily. All right, folks, that's, uh, that's all I've got for today. You can follow the issue on GitHub. I'm going to try to make an effort to get it done as soon as I can. Um, so at least it could be considered for .NET 8, if not .NET 9. But I appreciate everybody for joining me today, watching me um, pick through the uh, templates that we got in .NET 8. Um, hopefully we can make them better. Maybe they'll take some of the, the changes and run with it. Maybe they'll take all of them. Who knows? Um, I have to see how this will affect other templates as well. Uh, it's just an experiment at the moment, but um, it's been interesting to see how, uh, you know, things like the toggler are implemented and uh, what some of the uh, bad practices, for lack of a better term, with all the additional CSS code that was everywhere could be cleaned up. So it was still a good exercise, regardless of if they take the changes or not. Take care, everybody. Have a good rest of your afternoon.